Jim, can you hear me? I can. Uh, two things uh, I want to announce. You know, uh, when you call the meeting to order, I want to announce the that four CAC sure. members uh, who are who were appointed by their respective member governments, Scott, Richard, Ann Nichols, and Cindy, uh, that I've re received written confirmation. All four of those have been reappointed by their respective member governments, so they are all legal for this meeting. Okay. And the second thing is. Um, I only have Jean as a uh, possible non-attendance, so we may have three alternates who can't vote. So what about we'll, Ed? What about Ed Dills and her follow-up appointment? He was appointed. No, he had an appointment. I, I thought we got something from him that he had a follow-up to surgery or something. He's got a he's got a follow-up with the doctor. Okay, well, we'll just, we'll, uh, Jess B, you'll go through the, right. the roster and then we can see how many okay. we have. Okay. All right. Bill, can you turn it down? So we're at 12.59, so. Closing in. Closing in. <laughs> Closing in on that time. Let's see how do I do that? There we go. Ed is apparently here now. Okay. I'm here. Oh, good. I'm cell phone after a doctor's appointment, so it's not the best reception. Okay, just be safe driving, or if you're driving. Uh, out of the road. <laughs> All right, just be safe and careful. I can't watch. <clears throat> Things you have to do when you get older, I guess. Uh, yeah, I don't know anybody in that category. You don't. Well, Rev hasn't clued me in well enough yet. <laughs> Uh, I got it. <laughs> All right. So um, <clears throat> welcome, everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, Jessica, you're on, right? Hope I unmuted. Can you hear me now? I can. Uh, you just want to, we got, uh, we got everybody or you got enough for a quorum and all that kind of thing. Yep, I'll run down the list real fast of everyone I saw. And then um, if I miss anybody on this current list, let me know. And then as the new members are brought on, I will get those names from Rick and record that in the attendance later. Thank you. Sure. All right. So I see um, Scott, Karen, Joan, Ed, uh, Reb, Ann Esch, uh, Cindy, Steve Hart, um, Ann Nichols, Jim. Tom, uh, Jim Moore, David, Carlos, Cheryl, uh, Larry, Richard Robertson, Rick, Bev, staff of member governments and citizens. Was there anybody on the list that I missed? Did I get everybody? How about Rick Hoover? We have Rick Hoover today. Okay, got it. All right, anybody else? Did, did you say he is? Um, I have not seen him. Rick, are you on here? So n not Rick Hoover and not Gene Bray. Yep, that's the ones that I haven't seen. So. How about Tony? And I have not seen Tony either. So as of now, all alternates can vote uh, until and unless Rick Hoover and T Tony um, arrive. Okay. Also, since I have the floor, um, I, I have received written confirmation that Scott, Richard Robertson, Ann Nichols, and Cindy all were reappointed by their respective member governments. So they are all uh, legal to vote uh, today and the whole year. <clears throat> all right, well, uh, thank you. 
Um, just one quick reminder when you're making motions, just to state your name. Um, this is for anybody new to the group or anything like that. Uh, that way we can catch it in the minutes. And um, sorry about that. There you go. Uh, no problem. Um, so um, first, just let me welcome everybody uh, to our first meeting in 2021. Um, I hope everyone had a safe and joyful, uh, as much as possible, uh, holiday season, Christmas and New Year's, and that everyone remains safe and uh, COVID free. Um, we've had a, we lost a very, very close friend uh, during December to the COVID. And um, so um, it's, it's real and uh, we just hope that all of you uh, stay safe. So um, <clears throat> thank you all for you being here. Thank you for your time during 2020 and uh, looking forward to having all of you uh, and your su wonderful support for 2021. Um, Jess, I'd like to thank you personally for the support that you provide the group. Um, uh, it's awesome and, and thank you very much. Ditto. Um, <clears throat> uh, Rev, you want to say anything? No, I've lost a family member and others. And I realize how difficult it is to deal with the situation, quote, remotely. I don't care whether you're FaceTime, Zoom, meetings, whatever, it's not the same. And it, it's time to be thankful for the people we have. I'm particularly thankful for the PPRTA staff that we deal with. They're very conscientious and have stayed with it. So thank you all. Yeah, Greatly. thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, so We've established the voting members and we've done the call to order. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as presented? This is Tom, yes. yes. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, I motion for approval. I second, Reb Williams. Reb second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any, opposed, any opposed say nay. Okay, the agenda is approved as presented. Um, the next item uh, is the election of officers. Um, so Rick, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, I would like to just as the chair say that um, um, it's been my honor and pleasure to uh, be the chair for the last couple of years. Um, I serve at the pleasure of you guys as a committee um, I am perfectly uh, happy to be just a regular member, um, if that's the choice of this committee. Um, but uh, I would also uh, continue if that's the choice of this group. So I'll just throw that out there right up front. Um, but Rick, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Jim. Um, so there are three officer positions, a chair, first vice chair, and second vice chair. So I'll uh, facilitate uh, asking for a motion and, and processing the, the CAC vote on the chair. Then I'll turn it back over to the chair at that point uh, for him or her to uh, <coughs> request the motions for the first vice chair and second vice chair. I'd like so, to make a motion for chair. Okay, please proceed. Hi, uh, this is Joan. I nominate Jim to be our chair again. He's been doing such an outstanding job and has really been so faithful to this CAC. And I really enjoy his leadership. Mr. Cheryl. <laughs> second is Cheryl. Yes. Okay. Fine. <clears throat> Okay, uh, are there any other nominations? I move, move that nominations, nominations be closed. Is there a second to that motion? I second. Second, Ed Dills. Okay. Okay, so all in favor of the motion to reappoint Jim Godfrey as chair for calendar 2021, say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Rick Hoover's aboard. Your turn, Jim. Oh, 
Well, thank you all for that at vote of confidence. Um, I, I do, and thank you for the kind words, Joan. I, I do enjoy um, uh, working with the CAC. I think that PPRTA has a very, very important mission. Um, I think this group of people does an excellent job of representing the public uh, uh, during this process. And I appreciate your vote of confidence and I hope that I can uh, continue to maintain that confidence as we go forward in 2021. Um, so having said that, um, I'll open the floor for nominations of uh, first vice chair. Um, any nominations? This is Tom, I nominate Reb. Oh. Uh, we have a nomination. Do I have a second for that nomination for Reb Williams to continue as first vice chair? This is Larry, I second that motion. So we have a, a nomination and a second. Um, Reb, you have anything you wanna say? No, it's just been a pleasure. I intend to continue my uh, ability as long as possible to help the public and ha help them understand what's being done. Okay. Um, I move that nominations be closed. Okay, so we have a nomination, a second on nominations to be closed. Second, Ed Dills. Okay. Um, so uh, all those in favor of a Reb, continuing as first vice chair say aye. aye 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 any opposed say nay hearing none congratulations reb thank you for your service thank you um so i'll open the floor for nominations for second vice chair this is richard robertson i nominate tom for second vice chair I and second. this is lucky larry this well i'm not sure if I beat uh, Reb or not, but uh, I second uh, the nomination for Tom also. Okay, we have a nomination and a second. Any other nominations? I move the nominations be closed. Second. We have a, uh, Reb, you second that? Yes. Okay, uh, so um, Tom, you have anything you wanna say? No, it's a pleasure working uh, with this committee. I enjoy the passion that everybody's got on this whole um, endeavor. And I think we're doing the people's work here. Thank you. Um, so we have a nomination for second vice chair of Tom Viersba. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, welcome guys. I enjoy working with both of you and uh, look forward to 2021. So, Hey, Jim. Yes, ma'am. I just believe in that old adage. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's, some, <laughs> it's sometimes a really good adage to have. <laughs> and I would, and, and thank you all for this non-controversial voting. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> and that we didn't have any theatrics around any of opposition to vote. So thank you very much. Well, we could always stir up some trouble if you'd like. There's plenty hey, of time. Know. There's plenty of time for that. We have the whole 2021. So I, <laughs> I saw a slogan the other day about 2020. Um, be careful what you wish for. It's about to turn 21 and start drinking. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I thought that that may be appropriate uh, given what's going on. So anyway. Does that mean I'm of age to start drinking? Uh, <laughs> if you choose, if you choose, yes. <laughs> All right. So, um, opportunity for public comment um, for items not on the agenda. Anyone have anything? Um, if not, I do. Just very shortly, I, I read with interest uh, in the paper this morning that. Um, some of the federal COVID money is going to CDOT, $150 million. Um, and I noticed that uh, once again, once again, um, Dr. Cog in the Denver area 
uh, is getting 30% of that money um, while the rest of the state is, uh, uh, and we here in the Southeast are getting 17% of that money. Um, I, uh, I just find it uh, amazing that our representative on the CDOT Transportation Board uh, can't do a better job of representing us and getting some of the money that we need for some of the major infrastructure projects that we have in District 2, uh, my personal opinion, but um, uh, any money is better than no money. And the fact that we're, we're getting uh, $25.5 million in our district is a good thing. So um, just uh, wanted to go on record is that it would be nice if uh, Denver area got a little less, but. <laughs> I think Jim? I I second Jim's comments as well. It's it's getting a little old, but it is what it is. It is. You're correct, Reb. Wasn't there a statement that they are devoting a bunch of that COVID money to complete the I-25 gap, among others, money for the uh, bridge at the top of the hill, and I guess they're supposed to be adding a way station on the north side of the hill. But I thought uh, there was a lot of a lot of that CARES money was coming or CARES federal money was coming to that project. I did not see that level of detail. Um, Rick can maybe talk to that later when he gives us the I-25 yeah. gap update. So uh, any other uh, public comments for items not on the agenda? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so approval of the minutes from the December 2nd meeting. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? This is so Joe. Moved. So moved. Jim Moore, second. Who was the second? Jim Good Moore. Board. Jim Moore. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Joan. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any, oppo aye. Any, oppo any opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, the minutes are approved as uh, published. Uh, financial reports, Bev. Good afternoon, CAC and uh, members of the member governments. Um, as you can see, we had another, I mean, the staffs of the member governments. We had another great month. And for October, on the first page, the first graph. Uh, all right, there you go. All right, so we had 11,200,000 as compared to our monthly budget of 8.8. .8. So 2,338 above the monthly budget or 26.4%. So we're ahead with two months remaining, November and December of 15,666,000 or 18.7%. So um, I hope that Last two months are good and we can finish out the year really far ahead and then we'll be able to have a lot of carryover that goes to the transit maintenance and capital. Then on page two, we were ahead of last October's actual by 1,487,000 or 15.3%. We're tracking the same with uh, El Paso County. And so we're, you know, it's just been great. And uh, I don't have anything else to say about these numbers. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Bev, I would just like to uh, thank you uh, for the tremendous support and the work that you do um, for the PPRTA um, and the close coordination and work that you do with the member governments in working and staying on top of the stuff. Um, we've had a phenomenal year. Uh, it looks like from all indications, um, it can only go up as building permits and uh, whatnot continue to expand and continue to go along. Um, it just looks like uh, the only thing that could improve is some retail sales uh, and, and, and housing and lodging tax and other kinds of things. So um, it's just a, a, a great trend to have and let's ride it as long as the wave is there. Thanks, Jim. And this has just been the best year we've ever had, of course. And considering that it's COVID, it's hard to believe that the sales and use taxes are up so much this year. 
I agree. I agree. Any other comments for or questions for Bev? Thank you, Bev. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So item number seven, uh, capital and maintenance uh, uh, contract, uh, City of Colorado Springs. Who's going to do this, Mike? Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the CAC. Uh, Mike Chavez, City Engineering. I've got a few uh, items to go over today. Uh, first item we have is a um, change order for AECOM on the Black Forest Road widening. Uh, this uh, is to add some utility water line design to their contract. Uh, RTA will, will front the money, but then that'll be reimbursed by CSU when we settle up uh, at the end of the project. Uh, next item we have is um, a change order for HDR on the circle bridge replacements. This is adding- um, Mike, is it the Fontanero or circle? Is it I'm sorry, the, oh, the, uh, it's the circle bridges. I'm sorry, it's a mistake that, oh, uh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, got too many things going on. Fontanero bridge replacement. Um, we are doing a uh, task order for 199,000 to get them working on the final design. Um, and then we will be coming back probably next month with, uh, with the actual final design uh, total contract. But we wanted to keep them working because they're making good progress and there's a lot of uh, railroad coordination that we didn't wanna lose uh, traction on. So uh, this, change, uh, this change order is a um, yeah, or it's not, it's a task order just to keep them working on starting the final design and then we'll bring up the full one next month. Hey Mike, is the, is the railroad paying anything towards this bridge replacement or is this totally the city and RTA responsibility? Uh, let me double check that. I think it's ours because of the uh, original railroad agreement that we had with them, but I'll, I'll, I'll verify that. Shoot whoever came up with that agreement. It's their damn bridge. Well, they were here first, and that's unfortunately uh, most of the railroad crossings in the city. The railroad was here first. So when we came to go under or over them, they said, you'll have to maintain the bridge. And uh, it's it's unfortunate, but just kind of the way it, the way it happened back in the turn of the century. Okay, anyway, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll get a clarification on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Oh, sorry. Mike, I have a question. You yes. have asked for, and I'm going to round number it, $200,000, but you have four hundred or $5.3 million budgeted from last year. We're now in 2021, I understand. So having 5.3 and you take 200,000 out, you still got 5.1 million in the budget. Why have you, and you've got a total of about 12 million overall budgeted in 21. How far behind are we or how far, when is something going to happen physically? When is there going to be finished plans and you go out for bid or proposal, whatever? Well, this, um, this project, we're actually looking, we have it currently scheduled to go to construction in 2024, just because of, of money, you know, cash flow, um, uh, but we do want to get the design done, and then if there's an opportunity to move it forward, we will. But uh, oh. this is uh, slated to, to be built toward the end of the, the program. Okay. Well, part of the reason for asking you the two hundred thousand dollars, part of it, you had to put in a temporary uh, support system. It's called shoring. It tends to move around. It's more unstable than a regular foundation. And a crash on that bridge would be catastrophic. Well, that shoring is pretty stout and uh, it, it, it'll, it'll it, it's not gonna go anywhere, but it's not, uh, it's not the full uh, solution. So when we worked with the railroad a few years back, this temporary shoring was put in place, but with the uh, understanding that the city would replace the bridges in, in the future, um, which uh, we're, we're, we're confident that, you know, doing this in 23, 24 is still okay. We don't, we don't have any really safety concerns. Okay. Uh, can we go back one to the, uh, 
the widening of Woodland Road. Uh -huh. According to the second paragraph, the last line, this will work will be reimbursed by CSU, okay? And basically we're quote loaning them $57,000. I didn't think, I thought they should be able to afford that. That's all. Well, the way, we do, the way we do these projects is that uh, there's some things that we will end up paying for because we cause the replacement or the relocation. Sometimes they'll do upgrades and we typically just kind of um, settle up at the end. Now, if there's a, if we know of a big, uh, a big item, a lot of times CSU will budget and give us money up front. Uh, but in this case, the, they really didn't have any plans to do any water work until we brought the, the project up uh, to be designed and built. So um, at, at this point, we're just fronting some of the money and then we'll get reimbursed and settle up at the end. So we okay. drove the requirement, in other words. Uh, well, in this case, this is an upgrade uh, of a new water line. Uh, 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 I think a new water line. Uh, it's, so it's an upgrade uh, and according to the utility agreement, then they would pay for it. And that's why, <clears throat> like I said, even though we're just fronting it, because of the increase in population growth off Cowpoke and all that area up there? Um, more, yeah, I'm not sure exactly if it's... Okay. But anyway, but it, this is something that they're wanting to do. It's not driven by us, so they will okay. you know, reimburse us. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I, this is Carlos. I had a question about the, the Fontanero Bridge. Go ahead, Carlos. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, just for clarification, I was trying to go through my notes on this, and I don't remember, I'll be honest here, but... Uh, there's really, there's two bridges. There's the mainline bridge, uh, which is a capital A project. And then there's the siding, which is a capital B uh, project. Uh, I know that the design effort is being combined for those two bridges, um, you know, using the, uh, the capital A as well as the emergency bridge uh, funds there. Uh, my question really had to do is uh, uh, for the construction. Uh, the intent though is to have that second bridge, the siding bridge um, uh, replaced uh, during uh, you know, have it accelerated or moved up so that it's actually complete as part of PPRTA too. Uh, so I just wanted just to get clarification on the sequencing here and that this B item list is in a sense being, you know, promoted or accelerated in some way uh, as part of this, uh, a part of this bridge replacement, bridge replacement for the main line. Uh, yes. So per the agreement with the uh, railroad, both bridges need to be replaced. We, we originally had replaced them put the A main line as an A and the siding as a B. But uh, we have to design them together. And then part, part of the reason we're looking at building this later on in the program is we, we need to secure the construction funding. The uh, capital pro project will pay for the A, you know, the main line. And we're at this point looking at using emergency bridge to pay for the siding. But we need to, you know, get all the money together um, to do that project so um, so that's yeah, why no, it's understand. being advanced uh, it's being advanced effectively we'll be if, if everything goes according to plan i know it's cost efficient to do the designs together and that's what we wanted to do to save the taxpayers money on this it had to be done simultaneously but it sounds as though the the b item will be if everything goes well the b item will be complete you know we don't it will be done uh, it'll yes. be one of those things that it's uh uh, like other projects where we have, it's like, well, it's, uh, uh, we're done. We don't, we've already completed the B item list um, item here because we've done it using another capital, uh, capital project. Um, I don't want to go into the debate of whether, you know, that's the right way to go about it. I do understand it's a B item list and it has to be done. Uh, but I'd ask maybe Gail or maybe city engineering if they can just in their quarterly reports, uh, just kind of note, note that on how this interacts with a B item is, uh, list item just in case there's questions from the public that says, hey, why are you pulling up a B item list when we're not done with the A? Uh, just so that we have a good explanation on why that's the case and how we're actually being more efficient with the taxpayers' funds for, for, this, uh, uh, for this project. Yeah, and, and Carlos, if I could, this is Gail Sturdivant, if I could address that now, we actually do have to be constructed at the same time. One of the things that happens and why the, not only is there efficiency for doing the two bridges at the same time, but when we do the work on the A-list project or the mainline bridge, we actually have to put trains on the siding bridge. 
So we're going to have to do some upgrades to it first, so the trains can go on there and their more main their mainline operations while we go and do the the, the mainline bridge. So right now, if you go and look from both of the increase in programming dollars and the discussion in the projects, it talks about them being constructed at the same time, and then that is still contingent upon the. Um, the budget allocations in the future years, as Mike mentioned, but that there is an interdependency there that they will need to be constructed at the same time. Oh, yes. Technically, yes. No, I agree as far as the design and the technical components there uh, and, and the fact that they had to be done. But but it's an interesting artifact that, you know, you have to say, well, this is actually one of those cases where, you know, and I thought that maybe we did this already, that the board of directors already approved promoting this from a B to an A, that we've done this with other we've created carving out these exceptions, but I want to make sure that those exceptions are well, are, are up front and, and noted in, in the, in the, in the uh, quarterly reports. I, I didn't see anything there about, well, by the way, this is a B list item, but we're planning to take, get a head start on this just because it's more efficient and more, more value for the taxpayers. I do agree with the, the technical part of it. I'm just saying that from a uh, ballot measure, what the voters intended was a, uh, a sequence, not a parallel. Uh, construction. Um, so, so I'm just saying that, you know, there's a little bit of disconnect there. And I think I'm just looking for an explanation that's uh, in the quarterly report. And I'll, I'll be fine with that. And I know how, I don't know how other people on the committee feel about that, but I just want to disclose that to the public. Jim, I have a question about Pont Narrow. Go ahead. Um, Mike, I noticed that in on page 20 of the documentation, it says the initial final design. It's an interesting choice of terms, initial final. But it says 199,743. Do you anticipate another design bill coming in after this that will be the second initial final design? Uh, yes, we are negotiating that now, and it's, it's you know you know close to I believe like a million dollars. So we need to bring that to the board. But again, we while we're working with the consultant to finalize that number, we didn't want to. You know, we didn't want them to lag and, and stop work. So that's why we're doing this task order for two and seven, just keep them going. And we'll, I believe next month we'll be bringing the uh, final design, the total one. So there will be another uh, uh, contract uh, amendment for you to review and make a recommendation to the board ne next month. What, what are you anticipating being the final percentage of design versus total cost of the, of the bridge? Uh, you would ask me that. <laughs> I mean, is there a standard? Uh, th there's ranges. I mean, um, the uh, and I think the and that's one of the reasons we're you know we're looking at what they submitted just to see if there's some things we can fine tune. I think we're kind of in the range of what we expect uh, for design fees, especially in light of there is so much time that the consultants had to spend working and coordinating with the railroads that. Um, that that's why these you know some of these projects have pretty good pretty good design fees, but we work to keep them within the the range that we anticipate, which is sometimes anywhere from you know anywhere from eight to fifteen percent of the construction costs, just depending on the complexity of the the project. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions, uh, Jim? Uh, Jim, uh, if, if I may. Uh, Go ahead, I concur with what I want to say I concur with what Carlos brought up. I think from the uh, communication and transparency standpoint that it'd be beneficial to outline I guess through Gail everything that's going on. Uh, his comments I thought were very valid and, and in line. I, I agree and I was going to say just from a documentation standpoint that regardless of what document you pick up uh, it, it makes that reference. Yes, the board did approve it, but who's going to go look at the board meetings versus a particular quarterly report from the government. So I think that it's important to be consistent in the documentation of that board decision. So I, I support Carlos's comments as well. Uh, this is Rick. I do as well. Um, perception is hard to keep control of if you lose it. Yeah, so and, true. Uh, and the other thing is that two hundred thousand dollars, that buys a lot of five millimeter lead. <laughs> that sounds like experience. All right. 
Okay. All right, Mike, go ahead, go ahead and continue with, sir. Any more questions on Fontenero for Mike? Okay, go ahead and continue, Mike. Okay, next uh, is another uh, change order for HDR on the circle bridges. And this is uh, to incorporate their services during construction, uh, to do design during construction and also uh, some uh, project management uh, that they're doing uh, now because the design phase has gone on a little bit longer than we anticipated. Uh, also during the construction phase, they'll be doing public involvement and communication services as well. Um, so, cause there'll be a lot of PR because of the, the nature of the and location of this project. Um, we are looking at uh, going to advertise this project probably if not uh, this month in January and February and we'll get going uh, on construction in the spring. So this is a big project. And so we're just kind of getting uh, our construction management and, and uh, continued project management in order uh, as we get into the construction phase. Hey, Mike, I got a question. I got a question about your memo. Um, in the narrative um, under change order two, uh -huh. um, you mentioned the uh, design scope change on Hancock under the, the circle drive bridges. And it talks about curbs and gutters and sidewalks and whatnot. Um, to my recollection, and I, and I may be wrong, and this is really early in the year for me to be potentially admitting that I might be wrong, um, but um, there aren't many curbs and gutters on that section of Hancock at all, uh, to my recollection, not just under the bridges. So are we just putting in curbs and gutters and and, and stuff under the bridges, or is there a parallel or companion project to, um, so, uh, you know, extend that um, further on Hancock? No, it's mainly for improvements under the bridge. And uh, the, re you know, the rest of Hancock will have to be upgraded in the future with some other project. Okay, so this is one of those things where we're here, we're doing the work, we're gonna bring it to code now and worry about the rest of Hancock later. Yes. Okay, thank you for the clarification. There's very little pedestrian activity under that bridge anyway. Oh no, uh, I, get, I get that. But there is, there are some pretty good sized potholes on the edge of the pavement as you go to pull off onto the dirt under those bridges. There are some pretty good sized uh, potholes at the edge of the asphalt. Yes, yeah, so well, one of the things that we did, we designed, but we're probably not going to be able to get to is, is uh, on circle, uh, carrying the sidewalk all the way up to Monterey. So the new bridges will have sidewalk, uh, and then we'll have to connect it in the future. Or, yeah, we've so we've got the, the improvements designed, but we just don't think we can afford fund them at this time uh, with this project. Okay. Rev, Mike, you had a question? Well, a couple of things. Mike, with regards to the continuing uh, sidewalks on Circle, there actually is none on the existing bridges either side. Does that include making some provision for a crosswalk when you exit northbound Circle onto Hancock? Or what about uh, putting it on both sides, are you planning to put it on both sides, the sidewalk? I think we were looking at just doing it on what would be the east side. Yes, that's what uh, I would call it. Yeah, um, to get them up there. Um, but like I said, uh, we probably won't be able to do that uh, with this project, but we do have it designed and ready to go because um, that was one of the, the things that the community expressed a, a strong interest in getting that done. Uh, even though Circle Bridge doesn't have much of a sidewalk, people do walk on it. And, right. Uh, and that's why we're, at least at this point, making the bridge pedestrian uh, safe. And then we'll just have to make the rest of the connections down, down the line. I was down there not too long ago and somebody was walking on the 
roadway side of the concrete barriers um, and walking in the edge of the road coming, uh, I guess it would be coming towards down towards Janetil. Yeah, I, that, that doesn't surprise me and it's pretty tight. <laughs> uh, one other or another question. What is uh, the new estimate total contract dollars uh, estimate now? I'm using estimate because I believe in them, not budgets. And, and the start completion estimated time dates. I uh, believe the project budget program uh, is, uh, I have to pull it up. It's around, uh, I, I'm not going to guess, uh, but construction, we're looking about two years. So we start this spring. So you're still looking the spring of 24 before you open. 23. 20, 21. Oh, yeah. Well, I can't count. Too much of that 21 becoming 21. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Okay. Any other questions for Mike on that project? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, next item is... Uh, partial RTA payment for the, our cartograph system. And that is a very, it's basically an inventory uh, GIS based program where we input all our bridges, the bridge information, sidewalk, head ramps. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it goes in there graphically, but also you can run lists, query and, and you know, figure out how many how many bridges we have, how much sidewalk we have, how much was repaired. It's an inventory control and, uh, and also uh, is used for maintenance scheduling. So we use it extensively on RT, uh, RTA work, you know, the sidewalk program, the bridge program. So, uh, but other um, departments also use it. So in, the, in my memo, we show the uh, RTA contributing uh, 63,000 and then other departments putting in uh, the bulk, the remainder of the cost of about 112000 But you've listed it as capital, Mike. Well, which is it? When I say that, the PPRTA, $64,000 approximately, and you list a maintenance project number. Uh, that one, it's a maintenance one. That was my mistake. I didn't, okay. on the first page, I didn't just, check that. So you and Jim are both going to admit your first mistake of the year? No. Oh, I... We admitted mistakes long before. Okay. And I oh, I'll, get that, I'll get that corrected. And I wasn't, just for the record, I wasn't wrong. So therefore, I was, uh, that's not my first one. You're still oh. perfect? Okay. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, right, this is Larry. Um, I notice on the uh, second page of uh, that project, uh, Mike does have it uh, checked as maintenance. Yes, I have it wrong on the front one. Yeah. Larry reads fast. I only get to the first page. And... Good job, everybody. You caught my. You caught the same comments I was going to make. Okay. Uh, next item is. Uh, it's again. It's a kind of a split funding of RTA and CDOT to get uh, uh, radar detection. Uh, hardware to put on 33 signalized intersections. And so this is part of traffic's, traffic and management uh, centers uh, equipment and the way they, they use this radar equipment to track speed and volume and help time the lights. Um, so Mike, this is new equipment, right? Uh, I believe it is, yes. Okay, two things, is it just signalized and when I say signalized, I'm not, I'm discounting what they put up along I-25 to get on and off the uh, interstate. But does it include signals that are on I-25 or just in the city proper? And if so, that 350, 360,000 CDOT's putting in, why are we doing it for CDOT if they're paying for it? Uh, I, I, hey, Mike, uh, yes. this is Todd Frisbee. Okay, good. I was saying, I, I can't I can, answer that. <laughs> I can help answer that question. 
Uh, so yes, the, uh, where our roads cross, um, say, uh, like the interstate, where there are CDOT signals, a um, couple things that I'll just I'll point out. Um, uh, yes, it would include those signals, uh, installing equipment on, on those signals. Uh, it also, um, within the city of Colorado Springs, most CDOT signals, the city um, has a contract with CDOT to maintain um, their signals, to maintain and operate their signals. So that way we can get um, a better response to maintenance and a better response to issues that come up and and help co coordinate our and help to um, um, coordinate our corridors better. We don't have to go through CDOT. We can we we do all that um, through our through our through our system. The CDOT contribution, uh, we actually have a grant uh, with CDOT. Um, it's actually a grant that's um, several million dollars that we use uh, that we're using to upgrade um, equipment. Um, uh, across the city at, you know, upgrade to install these radar units, not only on CDOT signals, but also on city owned signals. So it's a, so this is a sharing effort of, of CDOT money that, the, um, that has been granted to us to use for the, for this advanced detection. Um, and we're using the PBRTA dollars to help expand that system. Um, because we found that, you know, with this radar systems that we're using, um, we can better time our corridors and give us better data uh, in how um, our interceptions are operating and uh, traffic flow uh, through um, uh, on these roads. So that's that's hopefully that answers your question. But that's sort of why there's that split of money. The question begs though: Is it maintenance or capital? You've got it listed as capital, but if it involves software, that's something that you have to maintain and update regularly it does not involve software this is this is capital these are these are equipment um uh for units to be installed at uh, these signals um okay i'd like we to uh as a former traffic engineer i'd like to know um is any are any of these funds being used or um would it serve the purpose of the police department in uh, um, uh, anything to do with issuing fines? Uh, no, it has nothing to do with that. Thank you. Uh, this is, if I understand it, this is Kim. Uh, it is, would it, would it be fair to say this is part of the intelligent, the intelligent traffic system and you're just adding uh, the ability to control traffic signals based on volume uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, for example, when they shut down I-25, everybody goes to Nevada. You can now uh, and anticipate and control signals, sit intervals, and that kind of stuff a little better. Uh, uh, in a in a sense, um, yes. Um, not you know the incident management part that you just described. We use that. We use our cameras that are we have in place to help um, uh, use our cameras and our message boards to get messages out to hey, there's a crash. Go this route. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the radar, these radar units allow us to uh, give us better real time data um, that we can use to um, to better adjust our traffic signal operations to respond to. Um, uh, traffic flows as they change over time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Todd, I have a question. Um, you indicated that you had several million dollars in grants or at least a, a sum of money in grants. Why is the grant not being used here and PPRTA is being used? Uh, well, we have, we are trying to expand, you know, our grant, um, we have, we're using the grant for other, for other things as well for our traffic signal controllers. And so this allows us to, um, uh, to provide these units on more corridors, more of our arterials than what we have allocated with the grant. Um, does that make sense? Uh, the grant used for purchasing similar equipment elsewhere? Uh, 
Uh, yes, the grant has been used to um, purchase similar equipment on our corridors. Okay. But it's also being used to uh, purchase um, other um, signal related equipment um, uh, uh, and upgrades to our system. Okay. Uh, Mr. Godfrey, I did have a question for Mr. Frisbee. If there's Go ahead, Carlos. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Ms. Todd, for that. Uh, just uh, as you know, with our uh, Plan CUS, our comprehensive plan, there was uh, some components there related to Colorado Springs being a smart city uh, using technology uh, to help us be, you know, be more efficient. Is this in any way related to uh, any of the smart cities initiatives that is occurring within the uh, within the city, or is this a separate uh, separate program that uh, all related? Yeah, it's a. It is a. Um, as you see in the, the description, we are, we have partnered with um, uh, Iowa State and the National Renewable Energy Labs, who is very interested in this system that we've um, have set up, and be, and and because we are obtaining you know real time data on traffic flows approaching intersections, it sets up the opportunity for us to begin to be more um, responsive to traffic flows and adjust signal timings um, in a you know in a more dynamic way which is a step toward that sort of smart city kind of I idea so um, uh, and we've we've gained some national attention um, Iowa State's a leader in this idea of sort of smart cities connected vehicles um, the National Renewable Energy Lab is also inter interested from an energy from saving you know, saving energy uh, and more efficient traffic flows. And so we are working on partnerships with them. Um, and and by having these systems in place and planning to expand this system has opened up opportunities for us to partner with these, uh, some of these national leaders um, in this area of connected vehicles. Uh, so, um, so this is, you know, we're excited that we can continue on this program and, um, and expand this um, throughout our city. Yeah, my, my question had to do is, are you working with, you know, you know, the Colorado Springs Office of Innovation, uh, which is actually doing work in this area. I would just, uh, if you're unfamiliar with their work, I encourage you to reach out to them, let them know, hey, this is some of the stuff you're doing. You might be interested in it, particularly since it is part of our uh, uh, overall, like I said, our comprehensive plan, plan to be, be a smart city. So uh, yeah. just encouraging you to, you know, I'm glad you're working with universities and outside entities, but we also have some in-house capabilities within the city um, that should be uh, uh, an integral part, I think, of this this uh, this effort. Um, uh, this is a yeah. good thing, and I do appreciate you, you doing this. Um, but I did have one other comment, too, or uh, question. And let me respond to that, uh, yeah. Carlos, if that's okay. Uh, sure. We work all the, you know, smart cities, uh, our smart cities group in this, in within Colorado Springs um, is well aware of what we're, what we're doing, and, um, and, uh, and so we work with them a lot. So we trade information. They look to traffic engineering a lot to say how you know to help them implement some of their um, some of their thoughts and their ideas. So we do have that working relationship with them. Excellent. That that's what I, that was my question. The yeah. basis of my question, and I didn't hear that originally, so I didn't mean yeah. on the spot and apply to you. You, you, yeah. you, you, you didn't you didn't mention you know the uh, key word uh, the forbidden phrase. You know we're working with our departments internally to yes. do this. Um, okay. That was what I was looking for. Um, the second question I had uh, had to do with public outreach and public engagement. Uh, I can tell you in my neighborhood at ECC on next door, sometimes people, citizens, uh, see these mysterious boxes appear on light posts and elsewhere, uh, and it's a visible thing. And people are like, hey, what is this? What's going on? And there's a lot of speculation. And is there going to be any sort of uh, web page or information from... Uh, you know, uh, you know, from the city as far as city communications is concerned, explaining what this is, so that when they do appear, people don't, uh, people understand what's what's going on. It's not, it's not, it's not law enforcement. I think Richard, I concur with you. People will see these things and they say radar and they think law enforcement. People are spying on you, and um, and unfortunately, that has happened before with some of our city traffic cameras. There's always these conspiracy theories that people are being spied on. So just trying to nip it in the bud, just don't have boxes that appear. And you know, what is, is there going to be some sort of outreach effort to explain what this is so people understand what's happening? Yeah, good question, Carlos. And uh, about a year ago, I was, you know, I did one of those interviews, you know, internal interviews with the city, with city staff, and it was put on the website, you know, our website says, what does traffic engineering do? And so I talked about about this specific thing, um, but I think it's a good idea as we begin to deploy that more 
um, we can we can put out some information about what these are, why we're doing them, and then some of the benefits to the traveling public that we are seeing um, in our in when we can improve our signal timing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm just saying, say, but, but if you don't communicate, my point is if you do not communicate, people have a tendency to fill in the, the gaps and, and you don't want that to happen with, with uh, um, a project like this that's actually pretty important to our traffic, traffic safety and operations. I'll note that and I'll work with um, communications uh, to uh, get the word out. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Any other comments on this particular project? Thank you all for your input. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Okay, the last item is just an information item. It's a change order to ACOM CM contract for the Sierra Madre Vermajo work that's continuing. Uh, they're working on another block. So this uh, is just to pay for that work uh, now and into the spring, but it's coming out of uh, privately URA funds, not RTA. So, but it is a change order to this RTA contract. So it's on there for information. So what I would need is for you to consider items one through five for a recommendation. Can okay. I ask a question about this item? Can I ask a question about this item? Go item ahead, six, it, Go ahead, Red. Item six has to do with the Vermijo and uh, to watch I, I, the place between next to the auditorium that in area anyway it's this not connected basically to bicycle trail the pedestrian bridge from the thing and the museum in your memo you or description in the front it says city planning and uh, city master planning for the for 25 years in existence Literally, you've gone through not just one, but two projects that uh, PPRPA votes for. And it's this, just to say a note, notation, we are, I don't know where we're at in terms of this is a question for Rick and Bev to keep track of it. We uh, all allocated a total of about $4.5 million based on that Greenway, original Greenway project which we were told was actually conceived either in 1994 or 1992, which is more than 25 years ago. And we weren't even aware. So neither of the projects that are included in that, the Bermijo and Sawatch, were put on a ballot initiative. So basically, to me, that's misleading the public. That's my impression. And I'm going to leave it at that. That's an editorial comment. I would, I am going to tell you, I'm going to refer to this again when we start discussing PPRTA3 and you start referring to something that was conceived several years ago, and yet you went through an actual ballot initiative and you put it into a quote, what I call slush fund called the Greenway Trails. And you end, end up with four and a half million dollars spent on something it is far in excess of that in terms of expense, but by good fortune or whatever, the urban renewal area and the special improvement districts are picking up a large portion of the tile. I don't want to see it happen in the future when I say that PPRTA3 and just hope something comes along and bails us out as the public. Done. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so, Mike, is uh, do I hear a motion? Uh, if there are no further discussion, do I hear a motion for uh, approval of projects one through five on the city's contract list? This is Joan. I move for approval of one through five on the contract list. This is Tom. I second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Okay, motion carries. Uh, Mike, you. while you and Todd are on, uh, totally unrelated to anything on your list, but I'd like to bring up a potential issue. Um, on Academy at um, 
Angora Point and Goddard. It's where uh, Canes, Lazy Dog, Applebee's, that intersection there on North Academy. Um, if you're coming out of Angora Point, in other words, where Whole Foods and Lazy Dog and Canes are, um, there are two left-hand turn lanes to go south on Academy. There is no turn arrow. It's just a green light. And traffic coming from the opposite direction just barrels across that intersection. Um, and I've see, I, I, it's weekly that I see several very close calls of traffic turning off of Angora and going south onto Academy. Given the, uh, given that Canes is there now uh, and Lazy Dog is there now, there's a tremendous amount of traffic, an in increased amount of traffic turning left going south on Academy. Is it possible to take a look at your accident rate and maybe think at the signals are there, it just needs to be put in a left-hand turn arrow or something. Is there possible to do a study or take a look at that before somebody gets killed there? Um, uh, Jim, uh, Mr. Godfrey, uh, this is Todd Frisbee again. Uh, yeah, we can look at that. Um, it's come up before. Um, and so um, the challenge there, obviously, if we go to and with the arrows, um, we're gonna, you know, we've got to take time from somewhere else and Academy is, uh, you know, is we need to move traffic on Academy. Um, and then it could would back up traffic further on Angora point, but I can look at the crash rate and see what's going on and see if that's a move that if there is some, you know, enough of an issue there that would um, warrant yeah. some change like that. I get the, I get the need to keep traffic going on Academy. Um, but when they do have an accident there, traffic is backed up for a long time. Yeah. So um, I, I get the sequencing, but there's been the, the, with the construction of those new businesses there and the redevelopment of that, um, that um, center where Canes is now, traffic backs out of the Canes parking lot out onto the turn lane on Academy. Um, and there, it, there's, there's uh, a, a, during certain times of the day, um, there are some considerable traffic issues at that intersection. Um, and as you know, traffic on Academy is not doing the speed limit. Um, and so I just ask you to take a look at that. Um, we'll do. Jim, if uh, I might, I'd like to second your point. And uh, while it may or, or may not have any PPRTA money in it. Uh, it is a tremendous congestion and safety point. And uh, uh, I can I can just see a car barreling along going straight and just banging the hell out of the side of a car turning left going south. Uh, Mr. That, Doctor, I'd like to just follow up on your comments about that intersection if I since it kind of was not on the agenda, but you brought it up. Uh, I also know, Mr. Prissy, if you're going to be looking at that intersection, I also realize that that's a, uh, a significant bike route. Uh, I take that bike on that across Academy on there. It connects with the Cragen Road bicycle route up into uh, Falcon Estates. So anything you do there, keep in mind there are very, very, very few places up on the north end of town where bicyclists can cross Academy going east and west. This is one of them. Uh, so anything you do there will have some effects there. Please encourage you to talk to our bicycle planner on this area too, if you're going to take action of some sort. I, I, I've heard everything that was said. I will definitely take a look um, uh, uh, at that intersection. Thanks, Todd. So, no problem. I'll take a look. And I'll, I'll get back to you on, on, on a decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, let's move on to item number 8A, member governments, other reports, uh, transit services. Yeah, good afternoon. This is uh, Craig Blewett, uh, um, Director of Mountain Metro Transit and Transit Services Manager. Um, and good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and CAC members. So over the, um, or I should say that our, our monthly uh, report is in your packet, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have on that report. But 
I've asked both the uh, PPRTA board and, and your chair, Jim, if we could use our time slot um, in your January meeting to present the results of our 2020 transit rider survey, um, which I think you'll find very uh, informative. Um, Aaron McCauley um, from our MMT team uh, was the project manager for the survey and is here to, to uh, today to present the results. So uh, with your okay, uh, Jim, I'd like to uh, hand this over to, to Aaron. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I appreciate that, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, can I just go ahead and share my screen? Please go right ahead. Maybe. Okay. It looks like somebody needs to give me permission. <laughs> Jessica can do that. She's okay. the master. Nice. Hmm. Jess, you there? Go ahead and give it a try for me now. I made you a co-host so that it would give you the- Oh, thank you very much. Yes, it's allowing me to do okay. that now. Great. Okay, let's let's hope it works. It's been an interesting IT uh, time. <laughs> so it's okay, it's working. Are you it's working. You can see things. Yes. Yep. Okay. Just need to supersize it. Let's see if it'll do it. Okay, that looks pretty good, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, you win. Yes. Yay, thank you. Okay, so as Craig mentioned, I'm Erin McCauley. I'm the Senior Compliance Analyst for Mountain Metro Transit, and I was the project manager on this survey. Um, just a quick note about why we do these surveys. We try to do these once every three years, possibly even um, more often, depending on how stable our system is. So if we're not changing a lot of stuff, we want to do it probably more often than we would if we're changing tons of stuff. <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so one of the reasons is it's really great to know how you're doing, to check in with your riders and make sure that you are meeting their needs, um, see what kind of feedback they have, things like that. The other is to collect data that we use for purposes throughout the year and throughout basically the three year period that the survey is valid. Um, one of these things are service changes. So things that you know people bring up, we'd like to see XYZ on this route or something like that. We take all of that into account. We also use the demographic data that we collect to perform civil rights analyses to make sure that our um, processes, our changes aren't unduly affecting people of vulnerable populations. So that's always in mind. So we'll go through this. The document is pretty heavy on fixed route and there is a little bit of a section on Metro Mobility. Metro Mobility is our ADA complementary paratransit service. So because we have a fixed route service, we also must offer um, complementary paratransit within three quarter mile of all of our bus routes. So we call it Metro Mobility to save time. For the fixed route survey instruments, we had eight and a half by 11 cardstock, and it was on both sides of the page, 33 questions and English and Spanish versions. So we asked eight questions about the day's bus ride. So where did you get on the bus? Where are you going? Um, how did you access the bus today? How did you pay? Then we had five on general transit use. Like what do you typically ride the bus for? How frequently? Things like that. Five on perceptions. That's really our report card. The how are you doing? Then we had the 14 demographic questions, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, age, race, ethnicity, income, you name it. And then we finally had one open form for comments. So anything that wasn't addressed, they wanted to just let us know, they could write that in. So our fixed route survey timeline, we ended up surveying the second week of March, right before the pandemic really got going. So we were actually able to get in under the wire. Um, we managed to get a statistically significant sample and actually exceeded our goal. So we have some really good data to use. So what did we find? Um, fixed route rider demographics. We 
are still pretty heavily millennial. In 2017, pardon me, we did a survey and we found that our ridership was probably about 40% millennial. So it has gone down just slightly. Um, generation Z, which is the newest up and coming generation, actually basically doubled since 2017, which makes sense as Generation Z is getting older, they are using the bus more, maybe more independently for a number of things. Um, the other thing that we found is we are widening the gap between the genders. So in 2017, we were very heavily male as far as our ridership. Um, that is not, it doesn't track with national trends. So um, mostly transit ridership around the nation is more female dominated. We are more male dominated. And actually in 2020, the gap between the male ridership and the female ridership widened. So we're actually at more of a three to two male to female ratio in, in terms of our ridership. And our consultant, FHU, um, looked at that and said, you know what, it might actually be that you're losing female ridership. So that's something to look into. As far as employment, uh, we're about the same as we were in 2017, about a little over 70% or eh, a little under 70% um, of all of our writers are employed full-time or part-time. We have about 17% students. Unfortunately, we can't really compare the student question in this survey to the student question in the 2017 survey because we asked it just a little bit differently. But you, the student number has gone up if you do a little bit of um, digging in the data. And it does make sense because we have a number of partnerships with colleges around the city. So um, Colorado College, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and also Pikes Peak Community College, their students pay a semester fee and then they get to ride the bus for that semester an unlimited number of times. So employment by industry, um, our ridership still, like in 2017, is mostly employed in the leisure and hospitality industry. So fixed route rider demographics. One of the most staggering things that I see from this survey is the low income. 60% um, of our riders come from households earning less than $24,000 a year. Uh, if you add it all together, about 80%, 84%, I believe, are under 40,000. And if you look at it using the Health and Human Services um, poverty level guidance, we would be looking at about 74% of all of our riders live below the poverty level. So it just shows you what an amazing service the fixed route bus provides for a community. Um, the, the vehicles above the graph, if you look at the one kind of in the middle, the able to drive, yes is purple, um, yellow is no. So you can see that most of our riders are able to drive. And then if you go up from there, driver's license, a little bit less, but they still have driver's licenses. And then you get into the ownership of the vehicle or the access to the vehicle questions. And that goes down pretty quickly. So it may be that income prohibits our riders from owning a vehicle, from uh, having access to a vehicle. Maybe there's not one in the family, something like that. So they ride the bus. Um, the other, the graphic on the right shows that we have about 2.43 people per household in your average writer household. And it also shows that the larger the household size of our ridership, as far as people, uh, the more likely it is to be low income. So food for thought, definitely. This is the writer types and behaviors. In 2017, we took what used to be just the choice writer and the dependent writer and um, the Transit Center, which is a nonprofit, they kind of threw that on its head and realized that 
you don't really just have two types of writers. Um, so they suggested something like this, the all purpose writer, they went more commuter based for the sole purpose writer. Um, but we kind of made it a little bit broader and then you had the occasional writer. So most of our writership are all purpose writers. They use the bus for everything, um, commuting to work, going shopping, medical, you name it. Sole purpose writers usually use the bus frequently or regularly for, for one task, maybe a couple here and there, but commuting is the biggest one for the sole purpose writers. And actually we have had more commuters than we had in 2017, which is pretty interesting. Occasional writers, as the name would suggest, arise, ride the bus occasionally, and they go to shopping, errands, appointments. A lot of occasional writers we see on Route 33, Route 36, um, the Manitou Shuttle. So, This graphic shows how our writers access transit or access their destination from transit. What's missing from the graph is walking. We know that almost 91% of our riders walk to and from the bus stop. So this graphic really focuses on the other modes. Um, you can see that down in the bottom, Route 33, more likely people are to drive themselves and park and then hop on that Manitou shuttle. Uh, not so much anywhere else. Sole purpose riders, maybe a couple places, but for the most part, that's our big uh, kind of park and ride route, I would say. So fare payments are also pretty interesting to look at. Most of our riders use cash or a single ride ticket. And that's interesting because it does contribute to um, dwell time at the stops waiting for people to put their money in, things like that. 31 day tickets are the next most used category. And if you look at the little call out graph to the left hand side, silent generation and boomer generation individuals are more likely to use the 31 day ticket to ride. And that could be because they might have the means necessary to pay for the ticket up front. The regular ticket is $63. Or it could also be that the generations are hitting the age where um, discounts are offered. So instead of the $63 ticket, when you hit 60 years old, you're now eligible for a $31 ticket. The other thing that was interesting that FHU found was minorities and millennials are more likely to pay with cash and single rank payments than other subgroups. So that we will take into account when we think about any sort of changes to our fare structure. So mobile ticketing, we are, as far as, as that smart city we talked about earlier, Taj and, and um, was alluding to that, but mobile ticketing is one of our initiatives this year. So we asked, one, do you have a smartphone? 70% uh, of our writers have a smartphone. 75% of writers access information related to our service with that smartphone. So maybe they're borrowing somebody else's smartphone. <laughs> At least 5% of them are. Um, we also asked, do you have a data plan? Because if you have a smartphone and no data plan, like how does that work? Do you rely on Wi-Fi? We found that about 37% of writers who had a smartphone also had a data plan. But the interesting thing is that it didn't have any sort of bearing on how likely that writer would be to use mobile ticketing, the data plan. So people with smartphones Data plans, okay. No data plans, okay. It was about the same. Um, what we did find was a correlation between the age of the writer and the likelihood of using mobile ticketing. So they found that the younger the writer, the more likely he or she would be to use a mobile ticketing application. And FHU identified this as one of the areas we could um, kind of help along with doing a mobile ticketing app, having our ridership um, easily 
be able to pay for their fare and being able to continue on and ride for life because it's so easy to do. We also ask as far as our report card, what's our strengths, what our, what our um, challenges are, things like that. So basically the, the question was constructed with a number of different items, which are all in the, the right-hand side, the A's through the B's. And, and we asked on the one hand, how important these are to you. And on the other hand, we asked, how satisfied are you? So if you look at the quadrant analysis in the top right, we have strengths. So that's your high importance, high satisfaction. Then we go to maintenance, which is low importance, high satisfaction. And then it goes on from there. So looks like safety on the bus and safety at bus stops, as well as convenience and transfers are our strengths at MMT. The interesting part though, if you separate the data by gender, it's a different story. So the safety on the bus is D um, and you can kind of see, I'll kind of go back and forth. I hope I don't make you dizzy, but D is kind of in the middle here, but the square are male riders and the circle are female riders. So the female riders rated that less satisfied, less satisfactory. E also, safety at bus stops and facilities. So if you look at the E, we're a strength on all riders, but females do not feel that that is a strength. So that is one of the things that we're looking at. We know we have a rider gap. Um, we're trying to figure out what we can do to improve ridership, attract female riders back to our service. And so we will be convening a task force to look at the survey and figure out what can be done. So we also did a Metro Mobility client survey. And unfortunately, we were going to hopefully do it about the same time so that we could compare and contrast data, but the pandemic hit and everything kind of closed down. People weren't riding, we had logistical issues. So that had to be postponed until June. We still ended up doing a more limited survey. So we didn't really wanna ask a lot about perceptions of the service, things like that when people weren't riding. So we really focused on demographics. So we found about the same thing um, with income, that our Metro Mobility client ridership is pretty low income. Um, as far as employment, less likely to be employed full or part-time than our fixed route clientele. Then we also looked at just a couple of other things. Um, how do you make your reservations? For the most part, it's made on the telephone. Um, not so much on our web system, which is kind of interesting to me because if you look at the bar graph, it shows how people pay their fare and a lot of them pay using an online prepaid account. So I guess my question is, well, if you're online anyway, then why, why aren't you using that? But it's, it's just interesting avenues to explore. <laughs> um, we also asked about subscription use and for the most part, 80% of our clients were aware that we offer subscription, but almost over half of them didn't really use them. It could be that they just don't go, they don't uh, qualify for the subscription. You have to do three days from the same origin to the same destination within a week to qualify for that. So it could be that. Um, and then down at the bottom, we have how often riders ride our service. So Metro Mobility, which is the actual ADA paratransit, service um, is ridden pretty frequently. There are a number of people who ride that seven days per week, which shows you how much of a lifeline the service is. We also offer Taxi Choice, which um, is rides within seven miles. And you can basically book your ride on a taxi instead of on a mobility van. Less people use that, but it's still a, a pretty good option. It helps us and the fixed route bus. A lot of people still are able to ride the fixed route bus um, most of the time, some of the time, and then they take paratransit when they cannot. So all good to know. And with that, I will take questions. Actually, before I take questions, let me let you know that our survey is online now. Um, if you go to mmtransit.com and then 
onto the About MMT Transit Planning Studies page, you will be able to find all sorts of good information. Um, we can also link, email that link out to you guys so that you can just click it and go. But, okay, now I'll take questions. <laughs> Aaron, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, anybody have any questions for Aaron? Okay, I do. Um, it's kind of a two-part question, Aaron, and, and Craig, sure. is, um, maybe at you and Brian too, in terms of, of planning. So in the demographic analysis of your current ridership where you took this survey, and I'm correct about that, right? It's the current ridership for that took this survey, right? Yes, it was anybody on the bus in March of 2020. Okay, so was there any breakdown in terms of where they lived um, in terms of, was it on the fringes or outer circumference of, of the neighborhoods or was it more core? Um, and so that, that's kind of a question, but here's where I'm going is, is there a way to anticipate demand or measure future demand um, as, as the city continues to grow into the outer areas? Um, your current ridership is gonna be within the defined routes and the defined areas. Um, but is there, is there a way to, or any plan to maybe do a broader survey that would allow you to uh, gauge the demand um, from some of the areas that aren't currently being served? Do you want me to start on that one, Erin, and you can, and you can go? Yes, please. <laughs> sure. So this is Craig Blewett again. Um, yeah, you know, in some of our transit plans, it's kind of, it's called propensity, transit propensity, and you're able to use sort of the demographic profile you have of your customer base and extend that out and, and look at the areas we don't serve and the likelihood that there would be um, demand or, or use of, of transit. And we've done that in, in, in past studies. I think, um, two other comments, I guess, I, um, the, um, Yes, it's more difficult to survey people who don't take transit than it is to survey people who do. Um, but still that could be done as part of, and I think that was actually done as part of uh, Connect COS, which is the city's um, transportation plan that's, that's um, underway. Um, we did a survey and, and asked people's various interests and in, you know, whether they take transit or they'd be interested in taking transit. So we get some of that data through that. And the other thing I was going to say was, you know, the, um, you know, it's part of the value of the survey. It's good to understand who your customers are. And, you know, we want to continue to serve them in wherever they're going to be. Um, but also, you know, as part of uh, Plan COS, which is the city's comprehensive plan, there's also a desire to really increase the role of transit and overall um, transportation um, serving uh, the community. So um, not only are we looking to serve our current customers and demographic profile, we're also interested in broadening. So, um, but I think, you know, the whole, there is a, you can uh, forecast transit propensity and you can to some extent um, survey people who are currently are not bus riders. And I can Thank take you. the other part of that. Oops, sorry. Um, there is actually, we did ask how did, actually right here, was access to transit a factor in choosing your residence? Mm. So we asked the question, oh goodness, it's the mail. <laughs> of course we did, okay. Hold on one second. Glad to see mommy. <laughs> Pandemic Zoom moment. moment. <laughs> yeah, they just, they love the male person. I, I can't help it. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so we asked um, whether or not access to transit was a factor in choosing the residents. So, sorry, you know, we're just going to cry all the time. Um, <laughs> but so the, the route's kind of in the middle of the city, 6, 8, 12, um, they were, yes, 
people chose the residents based on access to transit. So this is all very interesting information that we definitely look into. We look in origin and destination. We want to make sure that our routes go the places people want to go in addition to serve the people, like pick them up from their houses or neighborhoods. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that, that's good information. And, and I, I, I guess my question is coming uh, again, is that I've read several reports nationwide of, of the overall transit, a mass transit, rapid transit, all of those different areas um, uh, are hurting. Uh, because of COVID, and that the recovery is going to take years um, as the job, as the economy begins to recover and jobs become back around, and some of them will never recover, and some of these lower paying um, uh, de demand driver, demand riders that, that need this systems, jobs may not come back, and, and so as we recover, um, I just think in terms of looking forward of um, uh, as we recover, uh, we've got to recover the core and the base and the, and the foundation of financial foundation. But, you know, as we're looking forward and if plan COS is, is looking at that and connect COS is looking at that, that's awesome uh, as we go forward to expand into some of the more rapidly growing areas of our city. Yeah, agreed. And you know, during the pandemic, um, our ridership dropped less than the national average. So we did better than the national average. That's good. I think, you know, in Aaron's um, presentation of the survey and identifying our all-purpose riders, I think that's in part the reason. They, um, our riders depend on transit for everything. So even if the job moves, they still use transit for other purposes. And that may be some of the reason we've been ins insulated to some degree from the, the national trend. But Good point, and, and you know, you know, a question that came up yesterday when we were presented this to uh, the city's CTAP uh, committee was, you know, once the recovery, once once the pandemic goes away, um, you know, do we have a recovery plan? And our answer, our answer is yes, we're working on one. So um, there, there's a lot of discussion on that at the national level um, as well. And it's good to see the younger dry as younger ridership too. That's that's encouraging. Yes. Thank you. You bet. In fact, I just do one more quick comment. And um, Aaron did a great job of this in her presentation. But you know, the value of a survey with the information is, you know, how you're going to use it. Um, and we're using it in a number of ways. Um, as as Aaron pointed out, you know, the women's safety and perception of safety is something we're going to be looking at very closely. Um, it's also helpful for, helpful to us in looking at as we go to uh, mobile ticketing, which is buying your your bus pass on a phone. You know, who has phones? Do they have data plans? And so we can structure that the right way. Uh, we know that a lot of our riders can like to use cash. So we're gonna, no matter what we do, we need to continue the cash option. And, and you know, just really knowing your strengths and weaknesses and challenges are, are good, to, good to have. So we're gonna be using this information to uh, do even better. Great. Any questions for uh, Craig, Aaron, and the, on the transit uh, report? Thank you. Uh, thank you both again. Great report, good information. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, item 8B, maintenance of effort reports. Uh, Rick, you want to cover that? Yes, this is uh, just a high profile reminder to everybody that these uh, reports are <clears throat> going to be due at the February cycle of meetings. Uh, and I, I sent an email uh, two or three weeks ago to all the member government staffs to remind them. So just info. Okay, thank you. Um, item 8C, uh, Colorado Springs monthly change order and property acquisition report. Uh, it's an information only item. Anybody have any questions about the report in your packet? Okay, hearing none. Um, Item 9A, report of recent board actions, uh, information only, uh, nothing controversial came out of the last board that I can recall, Rick. Nothing controversial, but just uh, confirming in item number 13 that uh, Rick Hoover was reappointed by the board 
Oh yeah, thank uh, you. Ted Dills and Carlos. So there, there's the one at-large alternate vacancy right now and that's uh, been advertised. So there, we're beginning that process. Yes, thank you. Thanks for covering me on that. I thought I was almost wrong once, but <clears throat> um, item 9B, the annual report of CAC activities. Um, this is a report out on um, uh, our group, our CAC activities for the year. Um, um, I've been through this a couple of times, uh, had some inputs from um, um, some of the co-chairs, um, but I just wanted to make sure this is, uh, this is what uh, I, we, Rick and uh, me, myself put together reporting out on the CAC activities. Uh, if anyone sees any blaring errors or, or issues, uh, please bring it to my attention. Um, other than that, this is what will go to the board uh, uh, on our behalf as a CAC. We have uh, Tom Viersba's half a dozen uh, comments that we can put up on the screen if you'd like. Yes, please. Yeah, Tom. Tom was uh, did a good job of wordsmithing my document. Just teasing. Just teasing. I, I I'd like to see it up because his comment on I don't know nine B yeah nine B page forty two. I read it and I do agree with him. I thought it was a little wordy, and when I say that, it was mis misleading to me. It's just like three words. So if he's got it, I, I've got yes, a copy. Can you put that up? I agreed to Tom's changes, by the way. So um, I, I have no pride of authorship. Uh, somebody wants to say it differently, that's fine. No, so, I, just I, I had a trouble. I've read through all of his comments, so to speak. Nothing other than I really agreed with one on page 42. And I think it starts, uh, yeah, it's the first sentence, I think. There is a lot yet to be completed and 2021 will be another busy year for the member government and the CAC. And I thought it should be separated. The CAC will be, in other words, it starts the sentence, the CAC will be working diligently to fulfill our role. Fine, if you agree with something, that's what we did, so. Well, since we're having te technical difficulties to uh, show that, if, if the chair is accepting all the second vice chair's changes, then, uh, then we'll, we will uh, incorporate that and forward that onto the board. Uh, hey, Jim and uh, Rick, this is Larry. Um, are those changes incorporated in this document that was part of the package or do they still have to be incorporated in this package? They, uh, they are not in what was in the agenda packet. Once you make those changes, um, can you send out a updated uh, sure. copy of the report sure. to the members? Sure. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. And again, um, I, I just, if you see something glaring, bring it up. I'm really not interested in happies to glad um, kind of stuff. So, um, but if we've left something out or it's not clear or that kind of thing, uh, please bring it to our attention. But we do Jim, need a, like motion, to make a motion. motion and a second. Okay. I would like to make a motion, Jim. Go ahead, Reb. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I would move that this be forward with the recommendation that it is approved for approval. And when I say that, to be included with the revisions that you've approved with uh, Tom and mine. This is Larry. I second that. Uh, any other discussion or comments? 
Uh, do I have a motion to approve the uh, annual CAC report uh, to be amended? Yes, I made that motion, I thought. I mean, I'm sorry. All those in favor of approving the, the letter uh, as amended to say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. Okay, thank you very much for your support. Rick, you want to do 9C, an update on CDOT? <clears throat> yes, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory in my memo. Um, I have not heard of any additional funding uh, to answer the question from, I, th I think it was Reb early in the meeting. I, I have not heard of any additional funding for the gap at this point. That uh, doesn't mean it hasn't happened. It's just uh, I haven't heard of it. I, I think <laughs> the additional money that I've seen is uh, emails from Andy Gunning, PPACG, because PPACG's uh, position is that the number one regional project is the uh, new overpass to be constructed on powers at research. So I think um, PPACG board's position is that any new money uh, coming to the region should go to that project, which is uh, has a price tag of 44 million. I've driven the gap uh, two days in the last week uh, to and from uh, Castle Rock. And uh, I got to tell you, it's, it's a drastic improvement uh, in some areas where they've uh, made progress. Um, people still drive way too fast, 70, 75, and a 55. Um, and uh, when there's an accident, it's a doozy. And we passed a couple of those. Fortunately, they were in the opposite direction that I was going. Um, but uh, it's a shame to have a nice wide road that one lane's going to be a toll road. But anyway. So yeah, we're about at the half year mark, a halfway mark. It, it was a four year project started in September of 18. Uh, should be done in November of 22. So we're, we're just, uh, we've just tripped over the midway mark on the calendar. Just information. Uh, any questions for Rick on that? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to uh, item 9D, staff fuel report. This is uh, Rick's uh, drive around looking at things. Um, any, any, any questions for Rick on this report? Just information. It's my quarterly drive around to confirm what the uh, five member governments have, have claimed they've constructed uh, during, during the quarter. Any questions for Rick on that? Okay, hearing none. Um, do I have any uh, agenda topics for next month's meeting? Any burning issues for anybody? All right, hearing none. Uh, any communications by any of the uh, members of the CAC? Uh, any other members that are in attendance to the meeting have anything they wanna share with the crowd? Um, I'd just like to say thank you to all of the member staffs and the participants in this process, uh, the engineers, the planners, uh, the analysts, everybody, um, without your hard work, uh, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do and make the recommendations that we make to the board. Um, and so i just like to thank all of you for your contribution to this process and um, happy 2021 to everyone. Here, here. <clears throat> um, if there's nothing else uh, from anyone, um, welcome to 2021 and we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Everyone have a good, a good year. Good you month. Too, Everybody stay Thanks, healthy. Jim and Rick. All righty. Thanks, Jim and Rick, for everything that you do to. You're welcome. Thank you.